Hey guys, welcome. Uh, we're going to let folks trickle in here before we start officially. So we'll give it just a couple minutes because we just opened up the, the Zoom. So uh, come on in, drop us a line in the chat box uh, and let us know where you're tuning in from today. Um, we love to hear what part of the what part of the United States or the country or uh, the world you're tuning in from. So drop us a line in the chat. And while you're getting familiar with our webinar platform, you can also look for the Q&A box because we encourage you to ask questions uh, to our panelists while uh, they're presenting because uh, we will follow up with a discussion. So uh, Q&A box and chat. I'm gonna pull up the chat as well. And we got a couple of locals on the call. Thank you guys. Tucson represent. All right, that's what I like to see. Okay, well, we're gonna get started. Uh, welcome to Intersections of Environment and Justice from Our Bodies to the Earth. This webinar series is brought to you in collaboration with Biosphere 2 and the Arizona Institutes for Resilience. I'm Aaron Bouget, and I'll be moderating uh, tonight's webinar. This four-part series brings together the fall 2020 Carson Scholars cohort of graduate students to discuss the future of food, management and reuse of resources, environmental health and social justice, and environmental stresses and climate impacts. Our 12 scholars detail the challenges facing communities around the world and innovations that could impact the way we interact with the planet and each other. Today's webinar is, is titled, Giving Nature a Break, Paths to Sustainability. And we have three panelists joining us and I'll introduce them now. Maribel Cruz is a PhD candidate in the Arid Lands Resource Sciences Graduate Interdisciplinary Program. She is a young scholar working on water policies in Mexico and the interactions between policymakers and researchers. Her work in the field has brought her to the very busy Mexico City, to the most beautiful islands in the Gulf of California, and to rural communities in the Baja California Peninsula where she learned the urgent need to increase water availability for human consumption and the environment in arid lands. Verenia Felix is a PhD student in the Chemical and Environmental Engineering Department. Originally from Sinaloa, Mexico, she obtained her master's in environmental engineering from the University of Texas at El Paso. Currently, her research focuses on techno-economic and life cycle assessments of concentrate management systems for waste produced from water treatment processes like reverse osmosis. And Hamid Gaderi is a third year PhD student in the Department of Systems and Industrial Engineering. As an industrial engineer, he is interested in sustainable design and manufacturing. His current research focuses on techno-economic analysis, life cycle assessment, and developing decision-making tools for sustainable hard drive value recovery in the United States. Welcome, Mary Bell, Verenia, and Hamid. Thank you, welcome. Uh, before we start, I'd like to give a special thank you to the individual Carson Scholar sponsors and our University of Arizona sponsors Biosphere 2, which I'm uh, moderating here from tonight, uh, the College of Engineering, College of Science, College of Behavioral Sciences, and the Graduate College. And lastly, we'd also like to thank our Carson Scholars webinar mentors, Kevin Bonine, Chris Kokinos, and Andrea Gerlach, as well as our administrative staff, Maya Patterson. Thank you very much. So final housekeeping before I turn it over to our presenters. Uh, we're gonna hear our presenters uh, talk back to back to back, uh, during which we will hold all of our questions for our discussion period. So 
while you guys are listening, I encourage you to open up that Q&A box and ask questions. Um, I'll be fielding the questions and uh, we look forward to your input and interaction with us. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Verinia. Thank you. My presentation is titled, God Water, the Thirst for Innovation. I would like to start from thinking about water in our planet. So when we think of planet Earth, we usually think of large bodies of water and very uh, small pieces of land, but only 3% of the water that we have in the planet is fresh water. And out of that 3%, only 0.5% is accessible to us for use. So to scale it down and put it into perspective, if all the water in the planet was 100 liters of water, which would be about 26 gallons of uh, size of a milk gallon, then the water that we would have available for use would be about half a teaspoon. The water used in Arizona is mostly for agricultural use, followed by municipal use. In municipal use is where we would find ourselves uh, with commercial and domestic use, so whatever you use in your house and in your day-to-day -day life. And I would like to get everyone to reflect a little bit about if they know where the water that they are using is coming from and what your daily water use is. Um, here in Tucson and in Arizona, 40% of our water we get from one groundwater sources and about 36% of the water we get from the Colorado River. And only 4% of the water that we use is reclaimed water. Uh, and I'll talk about reclaimed water in a bit. Uh, so in Arizona, the daily water use per person per day is about 140 gallons of water. Now, after we use the water, the water goes through a treatment and there's different types of treatment depending on what we want the water or the product to be. There's wastewater treatment where we would have our sewage that we go to a primary process and then we can reuse that water for irrigation, for agriculture or industrial use. There's also a thing called potable water reuse. Now potable water reuse is especially important in arid regions and in inland regions because it's a non-traditional way of securing more water supply for future generations. And this is very important because our water supply can be affected by different factors like the seasons, the increasing population, and drought. So there's two ways to do direct, um, direct portable reuse or indirect portable reuse. The indirect portable reuse, after we treat the water from a wastewater treatment plant, we would send it to a purification facility and then we would inject it back either into the groundwater or into different like rivers or reservoirs to then be pumped out again and then we could use it. Now, with direct potable reuse, we would skip the environmental buffer and we would use the water straight from the wastewater treatment plant onto a drinking water treatment plant and then we would distribute it into our homes. Um, this last option is not so socially accepted yet here in the US, so the way that we usually go about it would be indirect potable reuse. So to treat water for drinking, uh, the process that the industry centers around would be reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis is a membrane process on which we would be applying a pressure to the contaminated water that has like different, like very high levels of salt and different pharmaceuticals and other waste. And we would push it across the membrane and we could get water with very low contamination that we can actually drink. Now this treatment train, as you can see in this slide, is a lot of steps. So it's not like you're just doing the water with one treatment and then it's ready to use. But along this treatment train, every one of them produces some waste because we can only recover about 80% of the water that we treat with reverse osmosis. So let's say that if we were treating 5 million gallons of water with a reverse osmosis system, we would have 1 million gallons of water that are waste, that are high in salts, that are high in contaminants that we can no longer use. So my research focuses on what to do with this waste stream. So there's conventional management systems for this uh, waste stream. One of the options is surface water discharge, for example, to different rivers and water bodies, or if you're in the coastal communities, you can discharge it into the ocean. You can also discharge it back into the sewage, but this has to do a lot with the policies and regulations of what the contaminants that you put back can be. 
or you can use evaporation ponds that you can see on the lower left corner of the slide, which are huge in size, or you can inject it back into the groundwater. Now in Arizona, we don't have the option to inject it better because policy doesn't allow to inject um, water with high salt into the aquifers that we have underground. So with this, we need to think about like the environmental consequences that some of these uh, options could have. So will it affect aquatic life? Uh, will the evaporation spawns start to smell funny? And will the people around complain with the deep well injection? Could we contaminate fresh water that's underground? So we need to think about new different concentrate management options, like the one that I'm presenting here, which is the one that I am currently working on, which is an ozone membrane distillation system. So this is another type of filtration system, you could say, where we will have a hot side and a cold side and a membrane in between. So the pure water will evaporate and go through the membrane and form little water droplets on the cold side. And these could mean that we could not only reduce the amount of waste that we're putting back into nature, but also we could get even more water for that is high quality that we could use for other things. Now, we cannot just say that we're gonna implement new systems and that they're gonna work. They not only need to meet our goals, but we need to assess if there are actually options that we are sure that will be better than the ones that we had before. Uh, will they augment the fresh, the fresh water supplies? Will they minimize the environmental impact? Are they cost effective? If they're gonna cost a lot more than what we do now, is it a go or no go option? Or will they be like very high on energy consumption and then have other environmental consequences? So the way that we assess these things is by doing techno-economic assessments, which I am trying to do right now, uh, calculating capital cost, operation costs throughout the whole life cycle of this new system that we're using and trying to compare it with the ones that are already established. And that way we can say um, if it's a no or go or no go, or if it's even competitive enough to, to go with. And we also do life cycle assessments. So life cycle assessments help us identify the key components that contribute to negative environmental impacts of systems. So for example, if we do the life cycle assessment for this memory distillation system, we would do it from the developing of the design, from the construction of the pipes, how much metal we're gonna use, what are the tanks gonna look like, how much membranes we're gonna use throughout the whole uh, 20 year life cycle that it has. And then we could calculate how much energy we needed to dispose of one meter cube of water or how much greenhouse emissions uh, is this system contributing to in like effects of climate change and global warming. Um, what is the aspects or negative effects that this can have on human health. So that is what I'm trying to do with my research now in comparing the systems and not only making sure that they bring more water, but that they are their option to what we have right now. And I would like to leave you again with another little bit of a self reflection. So if we think about just the city of Tucson, the city of Tucson in one month goes over the amount of water that would be filling out the entire state about eight times. So that's how much water we use in a month. If we think that all of this water that we're using would be treated for reverse osmosis purposes, that would mean that every month we are losing one and a half empire states of waste stream that we need to dispose of. And just so you can have an idea of the scale a little bit more, that little red dot that you see next to the Big Empire State illustration would be about the human scale. So that's how much water we're like not taking that much advantage of. Um, and that's all for my presentations. And now I will turn it on to Maribel. OK, thank you. So thank you for attending my presentation. So I hope I can see, um, yeah, okay, sorry. So thank you for the presentation. Uh, my name is Maribel Cruz, and today I will be talking about my research. And as Aaron told you, that is, I'm working in Mexico, and it is my research focuses on water. And turning on the tap, building alternatives 
to water scarcity in Mexico. Can you imagine turning on your tap and no water comes out? That's the scenario that actual currently we have in Mexico, at least for 50% of the population. And that's one of the concerns that they're moving to, to really maintain this research, to do this research. So globally, groundwater provides at least 50% at least of the water that we are drinking every day. Also, groundwater provides 43% of the water that we are using for irrigation. But most important is groundwater is the, the basement to sustain the river flows and also all other riparian ecosystems. As you know, here in Tucson, we have the Santa Cruz River that is, depends on the groundwater that we are using, that we have in, the, in this region. What is happening in Mexico? What are the conditions that the ground, groundwater has in Mexico? As you can see here, all these red spots represent of the water, the problem with the groundwater. Most of the, at least 50% of the water, the, the groundwater we are using in Mexico, are these aquifers are overexploited and several are affected by seawater intrusion, especially here. I hope that you can see my cursor, but in, the, in Sonora, in the northern part of this state, and also in the Baja California Peninsula, we have problems with because seawater intrusion. Also in central part of Mexico, here you can see this is all these red areas, areas all these aquifers are overexploited or they have a problems with contamination. Mexico relies on groundwater. 70% of the water that we are using for drinking every day, also for agriculture is groundwater. But at the same time, we don't ha we have problems with groundwater this this country. But also, we can have some kind of solution of alternatives or solutions. As you can see here in this map, this is a representation of the one hurricane, and also we you can find other representation of uh, about the tropical storms that every year in the northern part of Mexico we can receive water more water that we can use at, this, at that time. But in the same year, we don't have enough water to maintain several areas in this region. So how can we use this water or maintain this water? And how we can solve this problem about water scarcity and overdraft? There are several options. Some of these options are reducing water demand, Redu reusing treated water, as uh, Barinia mentioned before, but also increasing natural and artificial, and artificial recharge. That's the main topic of my research. How can we artificial recharge in Mexico? And what does it mean? What does it mean groundwater recharge? Is maintaining or storing water when you have this water, when it is, this water is available and use this water in the future when you don't have these tropical storms of monsoon. So that's the main point of the groundwater recharge. My study sites are three for now. And one is in San Luis, Colorado, that is a municipality that is located next to the border to the US. Uh, that's in, in, uh, next to Juma, for some people they are familiar with this region. It's located in the northern part of Sonora. My other study site is in Chihuahua, in the central part of this state. And the third one is located in Mexico City. What am I doing? I've been conducting archival research. Uh, I've been looking for reports from the several governments, from state, federal, and local governments that have been working with this type of projects. 
also I've been looking for uh, in universities in these three states and also getting information from the people that are working on in the field. Also, I've been interviewing people. I've been asking them about what are the main challenges, challenges they are facing when they are conducting this type of project or they are managing this type of facilities. Also asking about what are the solutions or the opportunities to increase water recharge projects? Because right now, only three are working in Mexico and one of them is the more successful that is in this case is uh, the case of San Luis Rio, Colorado. I'm, be, this, I'm talking with the, the manager of this facility. I've been learning a lot about the problems they are facing, but also I need information about what are the solutions to increase this type of projects in Mexico. And I found that it's a, there is a hope to increase this type of facilities to recover aquifers in Mexico. And one thing that is important and I want to remark is there is collaboration between local water agencies and researchers. And my next step on this, in this sense is to analyze what type of collaboration is be, exists between this, this group of people. Also, I've been learning about the, the type of projects that have been created in the arid and semi-arid regions in Mexico. Most of them have been working and some of them they are now, now under other analysis. Also, and finally, that is, I'll, I've been learning that beyond of technological problems in Mexico, the legal framework for water recharge needs clarification and improvement. So that's all that I have today and really appreciate that you're attending this presentation and thank you. And now as Hamid is going to present, thank you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Hamid Qadari. Uh, I'm a third year PhD student in systems and industrial engineering, and uh, I would like to talk about the value recovery of hard drives uh, and uh, compare hard drive value recovery options from the sustainability and data security points of view. Uh, a hard drive is where a computing device stores data for the long term, not just the things you save, but all the code required for the operating system, um, software programs, and other files. However, you may need to replace the hard drive in your computer for one of two reasons. Either your uh, current drive has experienced a hard drive or uh, hardware or software failure and needs to be uh, replaced, uh, uh, or you want to upgrade your primary hard drive for increased speed or capacity. What do you do when you are done with your hard drive? while having a lot of sensitive information on it. Majority of uh, IT professionals say that uh, they destroy their old or failed hard drives because they want to keep their sensitive information uh, from, from getting into the wrong hands. Uh, they do that because uh, simply deleting files or even reformatting a hard drive uh, won't erase every single bit of uh, data. Therefore, it makes sense to take a hammer if you want to just through your hard drive away. Uh, as we use hard drives in our daily life for storing our information, there, there are many data centers that use hard drives for cheap bulk and uh, long-term storage. Big te uh, technology companies like Google and Microsoft generate about 24 million end of life hard drives every year. However, these companies refuse to reuse or recycle the hard drives. They massively shred them uh, because of data security concerns. Uh, indeed, uh, today, uh, just a small portion of hard drives is reused, and many of them are shredded. In other words, shredding is the primary mechanism for data sanitization. Many fully functioning hard drives are destroyed because of uh, data security concerns, even when the data on the hard drive uh, is of low sensitivity. This significant loss of uh, 
potential value is due to the lack of knowledge of the capabilities of uh, modern data wiping technologies and also the, uh, the benefits of the other value recovery option. There are several re uh, reasons motivating us to do the value recovery of hard drives. First, uh, they contain valuable ma uh, material, including precious metals such as gold and silver, as well as rare elements. Uh, rare elements are essential for the production of uh, uh, GPS systems, cell phones, and uh, a lot of other technology products. Currently, the United States relies on 100% uh, importation of rare elements, while uh, HDD value recovery is proposed to be the most feasible pathway for recycling uh, rare elements. Disposal of hard drives, especially in data centers, is regulated. Data center centers have a collection rate of above 90%. That provides a huge number of hard drives available for value recovery. Also, uh, hard, drive, hard drives have uh, fairly constant form factors of uh, 2.5 and 3.5 inches that uh, favor reuse and recycling. The fourth reason is availability of hard drives. Teams of hard drives uh, have been manufactured and are in active operation around the world. In addition, millions of hard drives are taken out of service for disposal every year. Uh, as you can see in this figure, United States is the largest uh, consumer of hard drives, and therefore it has the largest share uh, in total generation of uh, used hard drives in the world. If we choose a hard drive for value recovery, we will have five options for that. This figure shows five feasible options for value recovery of hard drives. The first option, uh, which is the baseline, is to shred the entire hard drive and sell the shredded hard drive for aluminum. Uh, reuse of hard drive is the second option. In this option, before reusing the hard drive, we need to uh, wipe the data from uh, wipe, wipe the hard drive from data. The third option is uh, to reuse the magnet assembly of a hard drive uh, in producing a new hard drive. In option four, we reproduce the magnet. In this approach, hard drives go through some chemical and mechanical processes and break down into completely material level. And from these materials, the new magnet is produced. Uh, and in option five, precious metals, uh, waste metals uh, like iron and copper and uh, rare elements are recovered from the hard drive. Uh, we cannot uh, me measure the economic and environmental benefits of value recovery. Uh, I mean, if we cannot measure the um, economic and environmental benefits of value recovery, we cannot manage it. Uh, furthermore, uh, value recovery is not uh, always better than virgin production. So in order for us to be able to make a decision on value recovery options, we need to know about the uh, economic and environmental benefits. Uh, I, did, I did it in my research. Uh, as, as part of my research, I estimated the profit per hard drive for each value recovery option. I also collaborated with a research team from Purdue University to get the environmental impacts of different value, hard drive value recovery options. Uh, these figures show the profit and the avoided global warming for each value recovery option compared to the shredding option. As it can be seen in the figures, uh, hard drive reuse has the highest environmental benefit and all value recovery options are more environmentally friendly than the shredding. Uh, also, according to the results, hard drive reuse is the most profitable option and all value recovery options are more profitable than the shredding option. So from the sustainability point of view, it doesn't make sense to shred the hard drive while there are better value recovery options. Uh, what you saw in the previous slide was the traditional approach to estimating the economic and environmental impacts. In the traditional approach, we assume that one, one secondary hard drive can, re, uh, can replace one a new hard drive. However, in reality, reusing one hard drive may not completely displace the demand for a, a hard drive uh, due to the technology, uh, technological changes like faster speed and larger capacity of new hard drives and uh, market impacts like lower uh, price of secondary hard drives. 
Therefore, although reusing hard drives in, uh, is the best value recovery option according to the traditional economic and environmental uh, analysis approaches, uh, changing the policy of shredding hard drives to reusing hard drives uh, can significantly affect the hard drive market and change the expected economic and environmental impacts. Uh, therefore, before, uh, before making any changes in the policies, the impact of reusing hard drives uh, on the hard drive market needs to be investigated by uh, simulating the market. Hard drive market is a very complex system. It includes many variables that interact with each other and their behaviors uh, change over time. Therefore, we need to simulate this complex system to investigate the uh, effect of uh, reusing hard drives on the hard drive market. System engineers have used system theory to solve uh, problems like a large interconnected boot web. Uh, as a systems engineer, I'm taking that framework and applying it to this system because of its similarity to an interconnected boot web. So far in my research, I have created a simulation model and used it uh, to investigate how hard drive market changes if we relax company policies of shredding hard drive. According to the results, an increase in reusing hard drives will uh, reduce the hard drive prices and make data storage cheaper. It, also, it will also significantly reduce uh, new hard drive production over time. Uh, furthermore, uh, using, using this simulation model, uh, we could uh, predict the future state of the hard drive market and the economic and environmental uh, impacts of reusing hard drives in the future. This feature of the model uh, motivated us to perform more scenarios like the impact of change in the production of new hard drives or change in the inventory levels of manufacturers uh, on the economic and environmental impact. My research is uh, important because it raises companies, uh, companies' awareness of the benefits of new value recovery technologies and relax uh, stringent policies of uh, shredding hard drive. It also improved the, uh, the traditional approaches to uh, estimated economic and environmental impacts by involving the market impact and hard drive quality in the analysis. Also by focusing on the hard drive market and hard drive value recovery options in the United States, our research promotes the sustainable value recovery of hard drives in the United States and helps uh, technology companies in the U.S. to be more efficient and environmentally responsible. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Thank you, Hamid. Thank you, Mary Bell. And thank you, Verenia. Uh, we will uh, jump into our discussion now. And I would encourage all of our, our listeners again to add your questions to the Q&A box which I'll be, uh, I'll be fielding. Um, I wanted to start with a question for the three of you. Uh, all of you in your presentations tonight talked about reuse. And in, in each of your applications, uh, there seems to be a, a tad bit of taboo around the idea of reusing these resources. Uh, in the case of water, uh, the taboo might be around um, how, how healthy and clean uh, is this water that's being reused directly uh, that is not injected back into our aquifers or, or reservoirs, but going straight back into our houses through a series of filtrations. And, and then in the case of the hard drives, uh, there's the taboo of privacy. You know, people buy hard drives because they're putting private content uh, whether it be valuable videos and photos or documents um, and reusing a hard drive from somebody else might carry this kind of uh, extra weight in the sense of um, is it completely safe? Uh, so could you guys speak to that kind of societal uh, behavior and do we need a paradigm shift in the way we think about reuse uh, in each of your areas of expertise? Well, I think that when we are talking about water, 
we need to have more awareness on the perception that water is new because I think water is the ultimate reuse resource. Uh, the water that we have right now is the water that we've had since like the beginning of time. It just follows a natural cycle where it's like seeping into the ground, it's evaporating, we get rain and then we kind of harvest it again. So uh, we need to have like more clarity of what we're trying to do with water treatment is basically like, like we're saying, we're giving mother nature a break. We're trying to do that in a way that is maybe quicker, that we know it's safe. The water uh, treatment has testing across all the process. So we know what contaminants it had before. We know what we're removing. These systems are well established and they've been well established for like, uh, like a lot of years now. Um, and I think it's just more about acceptance and social perception of like letting people know how we do it to make them be okay with it. I have seen a lot of surveys where uh, these type of like direct potable reuse from like the sewage treatment plant to the purification plant to your house, it's more accepted in inland regions because we are so aware of how little water is around us that we are more willing to consider these new options, but they are definitely monitored and safe and the water utilities in every state need to comply with like federal regulations of what the water quality needs to be, that you will not be getting something that will do you harm. Yes, as kind of in my research as, as uh, in Mexico they are using also in the US there is a lot of experience re using uh, using reclaimed water for water recharge there is one a big in Tucson there is one example and also in California there is a big plan they are using the doing that but as a I'm familiar with several experience like uh, in California in the in one of these counties, they were trying to do the same like uh, several years ago. It was not possible because these concerns about the, what are the conditions and the people around all these communities, they were really worried about the water quality and all the health issues that can be related to use this water. But it's, it is weird, but in, in Mexico, the, the, the example that I mentioned that is they are using reclaimed water for water recharge in San Luis Rio, Colorado, but it's the only case that is now currently is working. So, but this is more common. And also when I, I was doing my interviews, researchers and also local water managers, they are looking more for options for reusing or using the storm water comparative with the using reclaimed water. Yeah, this concern. Yeah, um, actually, um, as for the hard drives, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, the, um, just a small portion of hard drives are reused and uh, many of the um, hard drives are shredded. Uh, in other words, uh, um, the uh, shredding is the primary mechanism for uh, data sanitization. Um, people even um, shred their, uh, their fully functional hard drives. And uh, they also um, shred the hard drives with, uh, that have uh, data of low sensitivity. And uh, I think uh, it has uh, uh, three main reasons. Uh, the first reason is that uh, for, for consumer hard drives, there is not a, uh, a, rec a regulated uh, disposal people have uh, some problems, actually uh, hard drive consumers have some problems for uh, uh, giving their hard drives to data wipers uh, securely. And uh, also, uh, the, um, also there is a lack of knowledge of the capabilities of, uh, capabilities of modern data wiping technologies that uh, can uh, guarantee uh, uh, data wiping and uh, also I think people uh, are not aware of the benefits of uh, economic or environmental benefits of uh, reusing hard drives. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Chris. 
can each of you discuss how your research has been affected by COVID, um, whether it be in the field or uh, conducting systems research uh, remotely? Well, in my case, um, I was looking forward to trying to do more experimental work and getting to know our pilot system more um, on a hands-on approach. And since COVID started to come our way in March, I've been working from home, I think, from March. So my research focused more on the modeling of the systems and on trying to input these models on software. So my work has been like completely computer-based ever since. In my case, uh, fortunately, I was done with my interviews and I was done with my research in the field. But I, I have, I would like to have another, other visit to the these places. But I, I was able to do that. So at least I have most of my information. But I think in the in the long term. It is a little bit a little bit related that you first question that is now with this information about uh, COVID and reclaimed water, I don't know that it's going to be more concerned about the water quality that you can use for recharge. And I'm not sure that it's, I'm wondering about that. Um, for me, COVID-19 pandemic has affected my research because uh, it has significantly affect, affect, uh, affected the hard drive market. Uh, in this shift to work from, uh, from home uh, due to COVID-19 has created an, an unexpected um, surge in the hard drive demand for data centers, uh, cloud and internet service providers, so, and in my research, uh, uh, to create the, uh, the simulation model, the system dynamics model, I need to find the relationship between uh, variables based on uh, historical data. Uh, since this year's data has been affected by, the, by a disruptive event uh, like COVID-19, I used the historical data up to 2019 uh, in developing the system dynamics model. So, uh, so that our predicted demand uh, do not capture disruptive events like COVID-19. Thank you. Um, this question is for Verinia from Sharon. Uh, she asks whether you think Arizona regulations will change for the injection of the brine, or is the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality not willing to consider this option? Um, I am unsure on what the limitations for not doing the deep well injection here are. So what I've seen in other places, it has to do a lot with the concentration of the salts that are in the brine. So basically what we would not be allowed to do is inject a concentrate or a brine that is higher on those contaminants to a water body underground that is lower on those contaminants. So the way that other places have gotten around that is by injecting it deeper into like um, under like whatever water uh, reservoir we have. And I don't know if this is not done just because it would be more costly or because like we do have the climate and land options here to do evaporation ponds, for example. So maybe that's like an, a more passive and less energy consuming, less costly option. But I think that there are ways to, to go about it. I know that there's uh, the deep injection wells that I showed in the picture are in El Paso, Texas, and they got like a waiver on the type of well that they did because they were like doing enough analysis that they knew that whatever they were injecting in was um, cleaner than the water that was under. So it was not gonna disrupt that like natural system. So maybe that's the way to go or look about that. But there are options to get like around it. And Mary Bell, we have another question from Sharon. Uh, she asked whether you think it's likely that Mexican law, which seems to be a barrier to managed aquifer recharge, 
is ever likely to change? Uh, I'm not sure. Currently in Mexico, there is a discussion, there is a conversation about a new water law. And part of my interviews were, I interview water, local water managers and also water uh, policy makers. And I'm familiar, they are aware about this need. And I hope that it can be with some good changes in the new law, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure because it, in the really long term, we need like a constitutional change because of the, how the water can be allocated right now. This is no, there is no clarification of how this water can be allocated. And I'm not sure that we can have something like that, but in some way, maybe we can have some, uh, some good steps in the future. And uh, Hamid, we have a question also from Sharon. Where do people now go for shredding hard drives? Is it something the consumer does? Um, how much does the consumer have to pay? Uh, and could you maybe talk about that shredding process a little bit? Yeah, uh, in the shredding process, um, um, the hard drive owner should uh, uh, give the uh, or her hard drive to the uh, shredder, and uh, uh, the shredder will uh, charge the uh, hard drive owner for for shredding the hard drive. So uh, we should pay for shredding our hard drives. Uh, yeah. What is, what is that, that? What what does that tend to cost? Do you have I any idea? The cost, yeah, the cost of shredding depends on the number of hard drives. Uh, I mean, for for a small uh, volume, um, it it's about ten bucks, uh, and uh, for uh, for large volumes, I think it's it's less than four dollars. Great. Thank you. Uh, Verenia, we have a question for you from Carlos. Would you say that the most that most of the problems lay in the lack of general population education or knowledge of the problem, or sometimes people are just too detached of the whole process, such as the whole problematic, uh, you know, use of water in the meat industry? He draws an example from. Um. I think it's not only like, oh, we're not educated on the, on the issue. I think we have a lot of comfortableness here, for example, where you can just like open your tab and you will have water coming out. Uh, in the presentation, I did mention that about like 75% of the water use is for agriculture. So obviously there's like other uh, issues that we should be looking out when we're trying to like save, wa save water. But I think it's more about like, it's a little bit intimidating. The whole process is very technical. And if you're hearing about it for the first time, if somebody was telling me this about for the first time, it was telling me like, yeah, you can drink the water that comes from your sewer. I don't think that it will be like that easy to understand. Uh, so I think it's more of a explanation, like a visual explanation. If somebody gave you a glass of water right now that was treated with reverse osmosis and then gave you a bottle of water you wouldn't know which one is which and maybe that would like take the fear away a little bit but I think it's definitely about giving more awareness to what we do and kind of like letting people know that the scientific community that's doing water research is obviously doing it for the improvement of our current situation so it's it's all for the better and not just to trick you into drinking treated water. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Mary Bell. Uh, in a recent podcast uh, from the Biosphere 2 podcast, I interviewed Dr. Ben Wilder and Ben Johnson. Ben Wilder is a professor at the university and the director of the Tumamak Hill Research Station. Uh, ben Wilder and Ben Johnson went down to an area in the Gran Desierto in Sonora to study the pozos, which are sacred watering holes. Uh, in which they found out that uh, these sacred water holes that were visited by the Tohono O'odham people for hundreds of years as a rite of initiation, 
are actually made up of ancient Colorado river water. One of the big concerns of Ben and Ben on that trip, uh, which was kind of a, a mini expedition of, of sorts, uh, they noticed that groundwater aquifers were tapping into the water supply and posing a major threat to the viability of these, uh, you know, sacred uh, sites uh, for, for folks leading into the future. Now you mentioned that you know 50% of uh, Mexico experiences turning on the tap and, and getting no water. Is the problem availability? Is it infrastructure? And how do you reconcile that many people not having available water with something like saving and protecting a sacred watering hole uh, into the future? Um, the first is about the this infrastructure, and I I'm not sh yeah that is not infrastructure in some way is uh, political will no? they don't have a in Mexico there is a problem with corruption and that is something that is not new because sometimes we don't we have a. Uh, economic resources, financial resources to build facilities, but this money go, I don't know where. <laughs> yeah, that is one, one problem. And also, in some cases, some technological problems, but also inequity. In some areas, there is a lot of water, but other areas, like uh, rural areas, there is no water, or in big cities, you can have water in the most beautiful or re really rich areas, but in the areas around this, these places, there is no water. Yes, inequity is, is one of the problems also. Yeah, and how can you reconcile the, the need of the water for repairing ecosystem and for the people that are, they need it, they are needing this water. I think that is no problem with, between one or, the, or another. The problem can be like a Berenia mentioned that is in, in the world, the agricultural activities, they are using at least 60, between 60 to 70% of the water. And we have to think how, how we can maintain our crops using less water and be more effective when we are, we are pumping groundwater. And in many cases, this water, this groundwater has been like a, for hundreds of thousands of years. So we have to think better about these opportunities to increase our crops, but using less water and maintain water for us, but also for environment. Thank you. Um, any last thoughts uh, between the three of you before we wrap up? That's that's it for our questions. Um, but any last words, Hamid, Verenia, and Mary Bell? Thank you so much for your listening. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, Mary Bell, excuse me, I cut thank you, you off. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll be more than happy if you have more questions or comments about this research. And yeah, I'll see you around. Great. Well, we've received uh, some great feedback. Uh, Sharon says, please compliment all of the presenters on excellent presentations. Uh, and for those joining us, we will have two more uh, webinars uh, in the, the coming weeks here for our four-part series. And thanks so much again for attending, uh, and we'll see you next week.